Welcome to the BizTech Indian Powered Roundtable on Cloud Gaming. Uh, really glad to have everybody here. We actually have a pretty unique opportunity. We've got Matthew Morris here from Unity, Bruce Grow from Polystream, Barn Cleave from Shadow, Mark Donegan from Beamer, Justin Berenbaum from Exola, and also Brandon Myers from Bad Panda Games. I'm Jason Schuster from Bad Panda Games, and I'll be I'll be moderating today which pretty much means that I will not be talking and letting the experts actually talk. So <laughs> if this goes right, you won't hear me talk very much. Um, but getting started, cloud gaming is actually a really broad topic. Uh, and I think something that me and, and Brandon kind of came across in, in preparing for this was that if you talk to a bunch of different people about cloud gaming, you know, <clears throat> several of those people will have different definitions for what they, what they consider cloud gaming. So I wanted to kind of get this started and kind of lay a foundation by asking uh, this group here, what is cloud gaming to you? Who's, who's going to start? Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We can, we can do it in order or we can just kind of talk. And this is just, you know, it's a round, round table format. So I'll tell you what, Mark, you said something first. How about you get started? Oh, okay. I guess that, that's what I get, right? All right. That's right. Okay. Well, good. Well, I'll kick things off. Um, so, so to, to me, I, I think um, you, you are absolutely correct. First of all, you say cloud gaming and um, a, a lot of people actually conjure up thoughts of more like esports. Now, um, you, you know, for us, we are, our business is video encoding software. And, you know, so we're selling to the SBOD services. So, you know, maybe part of that is where we sit in the ecosystem. Um, but I'm very quick to say, no, no, no. I'm not talking about Twitch. I'm not talking about, you know, um, uh, you know, essentially live events, live gaming events that are streaming. This is about when you take the function of the console and it becomes virtualized. And, right. and, and, and you literally, the rendering engine, I'm talking about everything from the rendering engine. The only thing that's happening, like, um, you know, if you want to stay local, is um, essentially, um, you know, controller input. Um, that's basically it. So you have a very light data stream going up and you have a very heavy data stream coming down. And that is, you know, obviously the video stream. So that's my definition. You know, when when we're referring to cloud gaming, it's where, you know, the console's in the cloud, literally. Okay. Very good. Bruce, you want to, you want to go next? What's cloud gaming oh. polystream? I think I think when one of the things that we do at Cloud Game, I, and I do agree with Mark's point, one of the challenges with a lot of this technology is the overloading of language. So you see it when people talk about game streaming, you see it when people talk about what is a GPU, and assuming a GPU is always something that can render. And all of these pieces, just sort of the, the language around cloud gaming can be very sort of um, morphing around a lot of these pieces. And I think cloud gaming is this. It, it's become this sort of go-to idea that I can just put a game in the cloud and then I can run it to all these devices. And so we go back more than a decade now and we've sort of been testing these ideas around cloud gaming and what it is. But in that time frame, we've also seen our infrastructure, our clouds, clouds became clouds, right? When OnLive started with GuideKai, G Cluster, we didn't have cloud. Now we have cloud and cloud gaming. What does it mean to do cloud gaming? And I think one of the things that we are doing today is kind of spending a lot of time saying, right, I want to substitute something I already have with another way of doing the same thing. And it's not really looking at what could cloud gaming be? What does it mean if you now have this incredible compute available to you? And what do we start to build and what will these experiences look like in the future? And I think we're starting to talk about it. We've heard some of this sort of thing from Madge and Phil Harrison at Stadia. We've certainly talked about it. We've got Hadian. We've got Improbable. I think it's really, for me and for Polystream, looking to the future, it is about what is that cloud, our architectures, our engines, and our game experience is going to be if we develop the platform with cloud-first mind, if we think about this is a new way to deliver an experience, not just a way to replace the console on the my TV. And that for us is cloud gaming. It's, it's an exciting world of things we haven't even built or thought of yet. 
Perfect. I love I love that. Um, Bart, I'd like to hear from you next, and then Matthew, and then uh, Justin and Brandon. So, sure. Bart, what is what is Cloud Gaming to Shadow? So, Cloud Gaming for Shadow is, as I said, there is there is a mixture of things it can be, but for Shadow in particular, it's about giving everyone access to a high performance Windows 10 PC. Um, okay. So we've discussed it, uh, sending the input to the cloud and then rendering that and then sending that back. But it is, for Shadow anyway, it's about being open. It's about keeping the PC as a standard, the standard Windows 10 PC, but then that is accessible to anyone. And in some ways, Shadow is just as simple as we, we rent out high-end PCs, but you can then see that on your PC or your Mac or your Android device or your iOS device. Um, so it's really you being able to use cloud compute. So it's like an evolution of something like Amazon Web Services, which everyone understands as a server-based um, PC infrastructure. But now that's coming to the point where it comes to personal computing. Okay, excellent. So we have, we've heard heard from from the, the the streaming people, Matthew. As far as Unity is concerned, what what does cloud gaming mean to Unity? Well, I think uh, we. Pretty much a, a good definition so far. I think the only thing I'd build on is when I think of cloud gaming, I don't just think of in the entire workflow going up to a, a remote. Sometimes uh, a lot of the uh, kind of client server architecture where either a small part or a large part of the workflow is offloaded to a, a remote data center. So certainly seeing some um, games being developed where you know only part of the workload that connected remotely and then the rest is still done locally. So I still think of that as being cloud gaming, but also uh, the infrastructure that's connecting multiplayer games. So I joined Unity as part of the multiplayer acquisition that have been doing um, infrastructure and cloud services for multiplayer games for the past 15 years. I think of that as being part of the cloud gaming uh, story and strategy as well in terms of helping connect players together for a, a real-time uh, synchronous multiplayer experience. Okay, excellent. I like that. Justin, how about you? What, what does cloud gaming mean to you, to Xola? Well, so that's a, it's a, like I said, a loaded topic. I think everybody probably did a much more eloquent job than I'm going to do uh, explaining it. For me, I'm um, going to just throw a couple uh, interesting buzzwords out there. For me, it means access and ubiquity. So for me, what it really means is providing a greater population with access to content they would have never been able to have before and be making uh, almost any device ubiquitous. Now, of course, that's the, the long-term dream. We all know that UI, UX, the input device, bandwidth, infrastructure, as much as we talk about it, is still a long way out. But the idea now that games can reach a broader and broader audience globally is actually the way I look at it. To me, it, it's a it's a means to an end. It's just another way to uh, allow access to great content. Okay. Excellent. I like that. Good, great, great definition there. Uh, Brandon, what's cloud gaming mean to, to you? To us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say everybody's right on track with what we would say cloud gaming is. Um, and, you know, the way I look at it is for an indie developer, um, you know, you're always thinking about how you can reach the most people. Um, and with cloud gaming becoming more of a thing, it's getting easier and easier to just broaden that reach, which makes it very nice for everybody that's trying to get into the industry and, and make something of themselves in it. I like that. I like that. Excellent. So the next, uh, Nick, moving on kind of to the next topic now, we've all kind of established a baseline of what, what is cloud gaming? I think I, I'm hearing a lot of the same stuff, so I feel like we're we're all kind of on the same page as far as when we talk about cloud gaming in these next topics, we know what we're what we're referring to. And so, um, how how is how is this going to affect our businesses? And our our audience here today is is mostly indie developers. Um, so I'd love to I'd love to hear hear, hear a little bit that way. Um, just so our our audience is getting the most value. But um, I mean. Is this is this a positive positive thing for us? Is this how's it how's this gonna affect us? I think it is a positive if we can solve for the economic models. We have to I think one of the, the things that 
everyone talks about, and I mean, we've, we've just heard it mentioned about things like device ubiquity, but device ubiquity still comes at a price if we've got to build that infrastructure somewhere. So we don't suddenly get to build everything <coughs> in one place and then build it more expensive somewhere else because then we end up still breaking problems. <laughs> so we've got to work out for cloud gaming how we have a model that also <coughs> with the desire of the, the game developers, the publishers, the, the indies that want to reach these audiences. And it can open up new audiences. It can change the, the dynamic and the mix and the new ways of delivering new experiences. And then we have to make sure the economics match it as well, because if we want to have a sort of entirely served from the cloud fortnight like experience with millions of people playing, we've got to build that infrastructure to serve all of that and still make all of that work. And I think it's really, it's making all of those things. I think this is one of the things where we have to look at what those experiences are going to be and how do we monetize them. It's not just enough they put everything in a subscription. We have to look at what are the models that are going to work and how we serve that content in a way that then we can reach an audience, wherever that audience is, whatever that device is, that can still fit this new shifting technology. Okay. If I can jump in, um, I, 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 yeah, I completely agree with that comment. Um, I think you know, we have a prototype to look at streaming video. Um, that is the transition from, you know, obviously old, old school VHS tape to DVD to streaming. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because the only thing that changed, there were no new experiences created, at least up to this point, you know, until VR and AR really starts to take off. And, you know, but we're still ways out. But there's no new experiences. The only thing that changed is the distribution medium or media, you know, depending how you, how you think about it. Um, and yet it's very clear, and if anybody on this call, you know, or anybody in the audience has experience with, with, with streaming video, the economics are super challenging. Um, and, and, you know, as much as, um, you know, Netflix and, and these very large services, you know, have incredible market caps and they're, they're incredibly dominant, if you strip away the it, it essentially the stock valuation, um, the economics underneath are incredibly challenging. I mean, as in like maybe some of these services would not even be viable. And so I think it's super instructive to look at that and say, just by moving everything to streaming and and, and getting even device ubiquity. Um, does not automatically translate into, um, uh, you know, into some uh, automatic increase, you know, in, uh, in, in, in profits or, or economies in some way. However, I, I, the reason why I really wanted to jump on this, uh, you know, on, on this thread is, is that um, it's, a new, it's the opportunity to create new experiences that gets really uber exciting. Because I think, frankly, just removing the console from the home that's interesting. And, you know, we're going to benefit from that. So of course we're, you know, we're excited yeah. about that. And, you know, so, so we're talking about that, but, but as an industry, and if, if I'm a game developer, I, I think I should be looking at this very um, uh, much more, you know, maybe broadly uh, than just, you know, Hey, I, I, I'm now going to be delivering to, you know, a hundred different platforms, you know, a hundred different quote consoles, you know, just meaning devices, and that's going to open up all this opportunity. Well, maybe not, um, because again, there is a very real cost to delivering to each of those platforms and maintaining, uh, you know, those apps. And uh, I mean, it gets complicated super fast. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's an important um, distinction that, you know, I, I want to make. It's not just about we're going to move to streaming and there's just going to be this, you know, the heavens are going to open and, you, you know, um, uh, you know, my fortunes are going to change. Like, it, it's, it's just going to be a bit more complicated than that. Okay. I like that. Uh, Barna, saw you unmute yourself. What? Yeah. Um, so, for, so speaking as a previous indie as well and got a studio, so 
The interesting ones are, as I think we've discussed, is there is the build one, any device, um, depending on which system it is. I mean, Guardio and Shadow both pay for the delivery. So that, as far as an indie is concerned, then that means you get better reach because there's new customers. But um, more specifically, there, Shadow is um, some of the PCs that you can rent have like Titan RTX cards, which really help with development. So you can run Unity, you can run Unreal on it, and you, you don't have to be locked in for like a year's worth of subscription. You could just rent it for a month. So if you're doing any development that needs some hardcore processing, then potentially Shadow, you can use that. Um, That's but interesting. But equally, um, there is actually a, a lot of developers who are using it to have um, their development studios that aren't all in one place. So they, even though they as people are dispersed around the US or Europe, because they're all diving into the same cloud infrastructure, it's very easy for them to share data. And so there's like an inter internal advantage to that, but there's also an external one. So we have indies who share builds to their publishers, to their beta um, customers as well. And the nice thing of that is the indie can make sure that the best possible experience is being played on that shadow, but also they know what it is. It's like if you send an executable to a publisher, sometimes they will run it on a machine that isn't good enough. So it's kind of being aware of what machine it's going to run in and test it beforehand. So there's actually from a development point of view, there's quite a few advantages. That's interesting. I actually had, hadn't, hadn't thought about that, but it's a, it's a good point to make. Matthew, how about, how about you? Your thoughts? So, I mean, um, building games for multiple platforms has been the core of uh, Unity's business for quite a while. And uh, <laughs> sure. so it's something we uh, experienced a lot of, is certainly when you're trying to develop for multiple devices. And it's kind of one of the key challenges that a lot of developers face is then having to manage all those different types of builds all the different types, you know, the, the hundreds of different Android phones that are out there, or even, you know, the dozens of uh, Apple iPhones that are out there. And uh, that becomes a really big challenge. And having some way of consolidating the number of builds that the developer has to manage and update patch every time they go through their cycle, uh, anything that helps with that is a big advantage. Um, I know. Certainly some developers have a home for 150 different builds of, the, of a live title in production at any one time. So you know, cloud games just that complexity and they build one load of many devices. That's going to be a huge advantage to game development. Ultimately, we need to do development and make games cheaper and better for everyone. Absolutely. Now, follow-up question specifically for Unity is this, does cloud gaming change the way that Unity maybe approaches their business model for indie developers? Um, I mean, cloud, cloud gaming in all its forms is having a, is a huge part of our future. You know, we've invested a huge amount, uh, both through of acquisition and internal R and D development. Uh, we're building out a lot of tools to uh, allow for better build processes. So, kind of. So part of us is point earlier in terms of having people working remotely. Uh, you know, our cloud build process kind of helps with that, so that developers working remotely can upload their build in one place through Unity's cloud infrastructure uh, and improve their uh, kind of iteration. And um, looking at cloud, obviously we're doing a huge amount with our kind of cloud multiplayer infrastructure. So you actually see all of uh, Apex Legends scale that to be successful. Also, Unity was uh, running all of the um, Marshmallow events through our inbox service, through our voice chat service, another cloud service that was part of uh, part of Unity, the Unity family. And so we, we were certainly seeing the adoption of cloud technology become more prevalent in the end of uh, and the cloud gaming in this core that we're talking about today is, is certainly something that all companies are looking at as a, a more long term future. Um, so it's something that we're part with a number of companies and working with them closely to make sure that developers make games easily for the, for the new cloud gaming platform. Excellent. Thank you, Matthew.
Uh, Justin, how's it? How's cloud gaming going to affect the types of services that Exola and companies like Exola offer? Did we lose Justin? Sorry, no, I'm here. I, uh, of course, I'm trying, trying to talk with the mute on. Um, it's okay. I do that all the time. It happens. It happens <laughs> the best of us. I think most of my clients wish I did that more often. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think one of the things, I'm a money guy, so I, I look at this from uh, the standpoint of uh, revenue model and uh, you know, for me, the cross-platform, whatever that platform may be, cross-pay, cross-play, the idea of being able to buy a game once and being able to play with my friends even if they're on another device is great for consumers. I think we, we still have an issue as far as the revenue models go for the content because anybody who knows and follows the revenue models on a Netflix or even, you know, PS Now and not up and all my friends with PlayStation, it's actually not a great model for developers. Um, if you're building linear short form content and the menu on time played, you're going to get hosed. So I think what one of the things that we really need to talk about is what does the future economics look like for that content if it's being distributed everywhere in all these devices? And uh, I wish I was smart enough to have an answer, but those are the kind of things that keep me up at night right now about cloud gaming. So, so, yeah. last question, Justin? so I think those are the things that keep me up at night about cloud gaming right now is, is what the future revenue models look like because the current ones for at least for the streaming side of games are not good or that profitable unless you're lucky enough to get a big fat guarantee for one of the platforms. Right. You know, I, might, you know, I think Mark, Mark was kind of talking to that to that point as well mentioning Netflix is that it, it does it does pose a problem. I, like like you, Justin, I'm 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 a money guy as well. <laughs> so that's those are the things that I care the most about. Uh, you know, Br Brandon, who's our CEO, cares a lot more about you know what well, has this affect the games, how does this affect how we how we do our operations, those things that I'm you know I'm the one who's worried about the economics of it. Is this is this actually good for us? Is this bad for us? Does this mean we can get more more customers, or does it mean we're just we're going to be able to make less money per title? I, I you know I, I'd like to know the answer to those things too. Um, so Brandon, as far as, uh, as far as you're concerned, I mean, how, obviously it's kind of speaking, speaking on behalf of Indies, but how, how is our business going to, with cloud gaming yeah, as it becomes more mainstream? I mean, it can vary in many different ways, but I, I, I don't foresee it being a major negative. Um, Obviously, with our industry, you know, we're constantly having to learn new things. And I mean, that, that's kind of the nature of this beast. Um, but I, I don't foresee any major negative uh, currently. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, Bruce, go ahead. Yeah, I just I wanted to add to this one a little bit because I think it's important. I think the, this is, I think, one of the other things that cloud gaming falls into. It, it keeps sort of positioning itself almost as it's coming and therefore it's replacing what we already have. And I don't see it replacing what we already have for quite some time. And I think to Mark's earlier point about how media didn't really shift, it just became a different distribution. I think back to the experience this piece is we have 200 million plus current generation consoles in market. That's an awful lot to ask um, yeah. how to replace. And we've got how many billion phones, and we're saying, right, we're going to stream to all these phones. And I think it's it's not really, we're just suddenly going to turn all of these basically <laughs> into dumb terminals and make them um, the new console. It's going to be about, we're still going to have a space for playing local games. We're still going to want to play games on our phone, badly connected network. We're still going to want a console for all those people that don't have the luxury a fiber to the home, and that's not going to change for some time, right? 5G is going to take a decade to really shift how we look at broadband speed. We, we're now at the sort of time in our lives where we can just about realize 30 megabits for a lot of people. Some of us are lucky enough to realize more than that, 
but that still 500 megabits is out of reach for a large population. And so it is still going to be about being able to develop games for local devices. It is still going to be, to what Matt said, about what else does the cloud bring. It's not always just about replacing the console experience. It's about maybe creating more of the world or offloading some of the compute so that we can distribute this compute better. And if we sort of think about where those sorts of experiences go and what we bring, then what it's going to be about is developing content that suits that distribution model for that audience, not just suddenly turning our back on a billion devices in market that monetize the way they do today. I like that. And uh, Mark, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that, but kind of stuff that stands out to me when you say that is um, as popular as streaming video is, people still buy DVDs. <laughs> people still buy yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, sure. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it, it, yeah it, 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 it's true. And I think, it, you know, I, in fact, I, I pulled up, um, so there's a, um, a, a very, you know, well-known venture capital firm in the U.S. Uh, by the name of Andreessen Horowitz. Um, they're awesome. they're actually a, a, a 16z the only reason i mentioned these guys is that they're um really uh excited right now about gaming about the gaming sector they're they're looking wow. at actively at investments and in cloud gaming and all and um and, and so i'm gonna i'm gonna connect all of this so so bear with me for a second because i i think it's interesting their perspective so um they are not excited and, and if you read their blog posts and you listen to Andrew Chen talk and, and you know and listen to their podcasts and all um, I, I don't think I've really ever heard them say anything like we're really excited about the sector because you know the entertainment value you know like they're not looking at this like hey there's going to be one or two emerging Netflix and we want to invest in those guys and we want to be along for the ride so in 10 years you know they're worth 200 billion dollars or whatever right. um, they're they're talking about the social component. They are super. They in fact they believe very very strongly that um, that gaming. Now they're speaking just more broadly, but but how can you be social if you're not connected? You know, and the cloud is all about connectivity, right? So this connects to cloud gaming is that gaming is the next social network, and if there is a threat. Um, to, uh, you know, to Facebook, for example, and I'm not saying like, oh, Facebook goes away in five years, but I mean, if there's a quote threat to Facebook in terms of people begin to migrate away and spend less time on the platform, et cetera, um, they, their thesis, and, and I think one that I'm starting to, it's starting to resonate with me, and I think a lot of other people is, it's going to turn to these gaming platforms, to these cloud gaming and and this also plays into then the new experiences. So I think we're really we're all seem to be um, you know kind of dancing around the same theme of um, you know it's probably for most game publishers not maybe the optimal strategy to simply go look at your catalog and quote unquote convert those to the cloud and just offer them now in the cloud. Um, right. the, the economics are the, there's just there's a whole lot of apparel potentially in doing that, um, but but there is incredible opportunity and where all of the the, the new economies are going to come from cloud gaming is in what you know what what can we create that either really isn't that possible or feasible on a console or maybe it is but it just you know, but consumer behavior um, didn't lend itself, you know, to this console experience. But guess what? Now on a phone, my my user, my player is is more willing to interact in, in a different in a different manner. You know, um, and so I think um, that is a, a, that that's the answer. At least that's the place to start looking in terms of. How do we make these economics work? What do we do, you know, with an existing business? Uh, don't don't abandon it. That's the answer. <laughs> you know, keep 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 you know uh, keep innovating. You know, keep releasing titles and doing everything. But 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 start with a completely fresh look at these platforms. Um, and you know, I think it was it was Bruce that said, you know, maybe in his very first comment about. Um, you know, there's still, there's a lot of open questions around, you know, around the architecture and around the software stack and around 
So, you know, Google is Google's Google. You know, there's one Google in the world, right? So, so we can't exactly just say, oh, well, let's go, you know, let's go reverse engineer and, and you know, hey, it, it's Google Stadia, right? And, and uh, not only can, can, can all of us normal people not do that, it's just not even feasible, but it's probably not, it's not even the right thing to do because, you know, they're building for their service, for they're the first in the market, they're, you know, so there's still, there's going to be a lot, there's going to be, you know, probably three or four years where standards are going to be worked out. Um, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to, um, have participated in one of the very early launches of a service called Voodoo in the U.S. And, you know, we originally launched on a set-top box and we had, and, and there was just all kinds of, you know, it's very archaic, you know, looking back, but that's, that, that's all you could do at the time. You know, and, and so now in retrospect, it's like, wow, that was so antique and so old fashioned. And why did you guys launch on set up box? And why were you preloading videos? And well, because we only had three megabits. That, that was the bandwidth that we could, you know, and we're trying to stream high quality video. And there were a lot of architecture things. And so that, that those same sort of, um, um, you, you know, it's going to be smoother this time because, uh, you know, with cloud gaming, because, you know, we have these incredibly massive, robust public clouds and, you know, a lot of video, the video technologies all exist, the codecs are there, device support is there, so we're, we're much, much further advanced. But there's still going to be some, um, you know, proprietary nature, you know, until things begin to standardize, which also is something that a, a publisher needs to also be aware of. You know, you jump in and you might end up getting on a horse that, you know, that, that, that's going to, you know, make a couple more jumps before it gets to, you know, where, you know, and you nice. got to be willing to, to go with that. So, well, I mean, I like that. <clears throat> one of the things that's like, interesting about this conversation is there is a, like a tendency when we say cloud to suddenly bundle the content with that as well. Um, so, yes. Stadia is like a, a new console and you have to rebuy your games that you already own. But that's not the only way that will happen. For instance, Polystream and Shadow both believe, um, and Bruce, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's more about the delivery of, of existing services. So Shadow has Windows 10. That is a standard. It works on Origin, Uplay, Steam, Epic. All the game back catalogs already work. Um, yes, you have to, you know, the developers who've got something that works on a controller means, yes, you can boot up Fortnite on your iPhone, have the full PC version because you can use a controller for it. And I think, as you kind of said, is this disconnect of people want to be able to have their game library they've already created, and that is the equivalent of their DVDs. And they're not that keen on buying everything again. So you just go, well, why don't you use your existing catalog, your existing PC titles that you own. Um, so I think that's one of the things that is very much um, one of the interesting things about, I think cloud will quite quickly get separated into, is it a new console experience where you can rebuy everything or is it cloud compute where you can use your existing software and hardware? I think from there, from a sort of, one of the things that sort of really excites me is what sort of games people can sort of develop and what sort of features can be built. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking one of the nice things about streaming video is, yes, it can be as little as 5 meg, so it will work on 4G. Um, but it does mean that if you have a game that you would normally only play on a LAN, like, say, an FPS, where there's truly destructible environments when you're sending more than that just when it's the data of the first-person shooter, um, I think there's really exciting games, and I can think of, there's lots of developers that like destroying stuff, they're always hindered by the bandwidth, of being able to sync that with all the users. So you kind of go back to when we had LAN parties and what you could do there, which is not the cloud. There's only recently in Fortnite, even as the ability to slightly build things because the bandwidth is free, but that's not quite the same as properly destroying things. In addition to that, which is nice from a designer point of view, is um, we've said multiple, you know, one input in, which is low value, so just keystroke, and then uh, one video out. But actually that works with co-op quite well. So you could have something like Super Bomberman with 
18 players all playing on one single instance because it's all one video stream couch co-op. And I think that's where we're going to see interesting game types come out. So it's the, what do you do when you suddenly have more or less like gigabytes of data that you can send between the PCs or have a single experience, but with multiple people playing it. I like that. Thanks, Brian. Matthew Brain, do you guys want to add anything to that? And by the way, I'd like to, I would like to come back around to how cloud gaming could affect the social aspect of gaming because I like like Mark, I follow Andreessen Horowitz as well. And um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about them is usually when they move into a space, a lot of venture capital follows them. Because yeah, yeah. Mark Mark Andreessen is widely regarded as one of the smartest people in that are alive today. And so when he says that's interesting. People, people notice. Um, yeah. So it's it's something I, I would like to talk about. I think indie developers who are looking for funding should have this on their mind because investors are yeah. talking about it. So uh, Matthew, you you unmuted yourself, and I'd like to come back to Mark. Yeah, sure. So I think well, I was just going to add to what Mark said. Is pretty sure good that Facebook know that uh, you know the world's changing around them, hence their investments in. Oculus Rift and pushing that sort of technology and making absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah they're, they're they're validating they're validating the thesis. You know, I mean, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. and like that's you know we, everything they're doing is made with Unity. In fact, there was a leak recently that kind of um, that they said that if they if they didn't get a chance to buy Unity, they're doomed because Unity is the key to to that platform of having the content and having the developers. Will make the content for those sorts of world. But actually, having you know, the world right now is on a flat screen that you hold in your hand, and the future of content is real time three D, where it's generated real time for you each and every time, and you're it's a truly immersive experience. Be that in a headset or something else, but it'll be a, a real time three D experience, and that's where where you need to see the future certainly, and. Cloud technologies that are helping that recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Back to you, Mark. You want to add anything? Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I think I, I definitely sparked the conversation around around social and um, uh, just you know, from uh, again, since our audience are primarily game developers, publishers, then uh, yeah, I think we're making the point really clear. You know, that there's. There's oper- cloud gaming opens up opportunities for new experiences, and it should really be about new experiences that are being developed, uh, probably more than just simply porting over, um, it, you know, the existing console game uh, uh, catalog, you know. Uh, although, you know, look, let's, I do want to come back, though, to one comment, just because I, I don't want it to be taken too far. Um, sure. th- and, and that is my comment uh, that, uh, you know, if we look at the video business, the economics um, are, are, you know, are a, a bit challenged um, in simply streaming. And I, I, the point that I want to make is, is that there's also some very, um, there's still winners in this, right? right. So um, obviously we can think about Netflix, but, 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 let's, but let's separate them out. So, you know, it, it, for the first time now, um, it's possible for someone to take a niche business you know, niche content and to actually build a little business around this that previously in the TV or the broadcast ecosystem, um, or if you had to distribute everything, literally physical media to a video store, um, the economics weren't feasible. So uh, on one hand, you know, if someone's aspiration is to build, you know, a, a $15 billion company, you know that's one thing, but if but if someone's aspiration is to build a really nice little business and little, not little, depending on where you come from, but fifteen million dollar company, sure. uh, cloud. I mean, cloud is going to make that possible in ways that that even today um, that that, uh, that that it simply isn't possible. And so I think that's also a really important distinction. And you know, since again our audience, I, I believe, are primarily indie developers. Then you know maybe that really resonates. Like, well, you know, hey, I, you know, that that doesn't sound too bad, you know, uh, to, to me. So, 
So I, I just wanted to make sure that I we also didn't, um, you know, or at least I didn't put out uh, too too much of maybe a little bit of a negative thing there, like, hey, we, you know, if we go down this path, you know, the economics don't work out because that that isn't that that isn't the whole story. No, I think I think the point you're making is that it's just it's going to have to change. It's going to it's going to have to change, but it'll you know it's you know there's opportunity. So yeah, okay. so absolutely. I, Bruce, I, I say I saw your hand come up. Yeah, I was going to say, I think on that one is we think about the games and the cloud and the experiences. And in some ways, this is where I think we have seen some great innovation, particularly in game streaming, not cloud gaming. We're looking at different devices and what you use different devices for, but bringing them into the same environment, bring them into them the same social channel so that you can look at all of these different devices and say, what can this device do and how can it still bring me into engage with all of these people? And if you then start to think about that experience for interactive entertainment and truly sort of creating something that says, well, here's something I can play on a big screen, but I want to interact with it completely differently on my phone when I'm out and about. But bringing that same audience together, well, that unlocks huge sort of opportunities for everything we can do here. And that's something that you sort of back end off the cloud. You build the, the infrastructure, you build all of your sort of networks for, and then the devices just become your portal into that world based on what that device is best suited for. And that might also open up a world of where these platforms start to get built. And kind of what Mark's saying is sometimes it might be about how do you create a niche channel that fits a very certain audience and it's backed into something in the cloud that's much larger, but it fits sort of your demographic, your audience, people you're trying to talk to. And we see that with everything from YouTube to Twitch to Mixer. Not every channel has to have 10 million viewers, right? Some channels do very well from a dedicated few tens of thousands of viewers that are absolutely about that. And now we can bring that kind of experience to interactive. But we can now start to think about each of the devices as well as bringing that experience to that device, to that audience. And also, I mean, it's, it's got to be culturally relevant. It's got to be geographically relevant. It's got to be all of those things can now be unlocked when we start thinking about, right, what, what does that person use typically? Where are they? What do they want to engage with? And how do we bring them in? And that does unlock huge amounts of ways of talking to each other. Absolutely. Love that. Thank you, Bruce. Mark, Matthew, Brian, all of you with great, great comments. Uh, Brandon, Justin, do you want to add any, any anything else to that before we kind of move oh, on? Right. I, I agree. I think it's going to be about new experiences. And this is one of the reasons I love the whole rise of the MD for the last five years, right? All the different things, all the different uh, experiences that would have never happened, you know, when I started in the industry because it was in the uh, cost of doing something on a console and, and was just so ridiculously expensive. Um, so I just think it's, you know, we're all sitting around here talking, but the, the, the idea and the next cool stuff is going to come from some sort of developer either out there listening or some developer in some remote place that figures out a way to take advantage of this that we haven't even thought of yet. And it's because of necessity, right? They're, you know, I don't know if they're somewhere in Africa or Latin America. And the only way they can actually get their game out there is some, thing we've never even thought of and i think that's when we're all going to go holy crap i never thought of that and that person is going to be you know the, the next huge success in our industry with that which that's actually what excites me the most about this and the technology mm -hmm. is you know the, our ceo has said this always that great games can come from anywhere and i think that wasn't true 15 20 years ago but it certainly is now and i think it we, we're just adding more anywhere to that list Absolutely. I, I, I like that. I, I like that quote. And yeah, good games can come from anywhere. Um, definitely seen some huge games come out of very small studios uh, in the last in the last 10 years or so. So that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, Brandon, you want to add anything to that? No, no, I mean, I think it's been covered very well. <laughs> pretty pretty <laughs> hard to add. <laughs> some great stuff. I, the fact that we, you know, I, I would my whole plan was to move like topic to topic, but we've actually covered a lot of the things that I think that we really wanted to, to hear out of this. 
Um, so kind of moving into our last 15 minutes or so, um, big question, what does a future gamer look like? We've had this kind of definition of, of what, a, what a gamer is, it's more social. What is, what does a gamer look like? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this one off for a change. I'm going to say it looks <laughs> All like, right, go for it, Justin. I'm going to say the gamer looks female. I think that uh, okay. there was some data that I shared at a talk a couple weeks ago that showed over 75% of, I guess, women or young women between 13 and 17 are now playing games on the phone, which is about 10% more than the boys or men the same age. And the number on PC and consoles is evening out, believe it or not. So I actually think the future is female, for, for, to be honest with you. And I don't mean to sound corny or cheesy or pandering. I mean that it's been an audience that our markets overlooked both purposely and for lack of skill to address for a long time. And, and I think not only do I think the next game can come any, from anywhere, I think some of the next great games that come from female-led studios in the middle of nowhere. And so if I have to put my crystal ball out, that's that's one thing I'm going to throw out there. I, I like that. And I like how you how you phrased it because I mean the data the data is the data. You know, regardless of regardless of how you want to present it, the data is the data. Uh, my my wife of 10 years is a is a serious gamer. She's a more serious gamer than I am. Um, I, I wish I could be on her level, but I just I'm not. <laughs> so I I would agree with you. Yeah. Gaming is female. So, uh, Mark, Bruce, um, your thoughts? I'm going to say that I think it, it comes back to the previous point, which is we don't know what's going to be created yet. What we do know is we're going to be able to tap into entirely new experiences, and those new experiences are going to open up things we've never seen before. And so in doing that, I think it's just going to be much more of creating creating more experiences that can reach more audiences and until at some point we just lose this idea that somebody's a gamer. I don't think you really talk yeah. about people being a TV watcher anymore or a radio listener or music. Or music yeah. Yeah. So I heard the expression uh, player and, and I like that instead of a gamer, I like the idea of the expression player. Yeah. Because gamer sometimes brings a negative connotation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I like that too because I, 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 you know, the first thing that came to mind, and as I've thought about this, like, so what does happen? You know, when we fast forward, you know, let's say ten years, and we're having this same discussion, right? But except now, there's you know, uh, very clear business models, and emer you know, how do we? It's it, it's not going to be this term like gamer. It, it's it, you know, it's going to be the audience. The audience are players, right? And right. I think the audience and these players are literally going to be everybody because it's super fascinating how um, it, you, it, you know, everybody has their taste in movies, right? And in music, you know, oh, I like country. I like rock. I like pop. I like whatever, you know, I like this kind of movie. I like that. Everybody has their, some people don't like movies, but yet that same person who says, oh, I hate country music will play a game that, Somebody who only liked rock and only, you know, it, 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 it's interesting to me how games can kind of just cut across where these other genres of entertainment, you know, people can have really kind of queer opinions, you know, like, oh, I hate or I love, you know, this, yep. it, it's super fascinating to me. And so I think, you know, as these platforms are emerging and as they're giving people ubiquitous access and, and, and the and the barriers are getting lowered in terms of even you know, well, gee, I would enjoy being a player, but I really don't want to, you know, it's $200, go buy a console, but, you know, there's still, like, right now today, there's still sort of this 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 barrier to entry. Like, you have to decide, you know, like, okay, let's go buy a console. Well, that's a little bit of an investment, you know? Some people, it's more of an investment than others, but still, you have to even just go to the store. You've got to decide which one. You've got to, you know, but when I can just uh, pick up my phone, you know, and now with display capability being the way they are, and when 5G is here, uh, uh, this is a very long-winded answer, but um, the gamer is everybody. The game is it, it, it's, it's everybody's a player, and I, I think we won't even be thinking. You know, yeah, there's going to be maybe this really hardcore subset, 
you know, abuser that maybe we refer to as gamers, you know, but ultimately it's, it's going to be everybody. I like that. I like that. Barn and Matthew? I just good. I think you're spot on that whole that whole world between entertainment and games. I think will gradually blur. Uh, you know, yeah, it's the experiences where you can sit with a virtual headset on in a virtual cinema, yeah. or a real film. Uh, so you can have that kind of social experience in a sat at home, but it feels like you're in a cinema. You know, all of those sorts of experiences are just going to grow, I and mean, it could be that that experience is you go off and you play Killing Floor Two with your friends. Uh, or it could be, you know, you be in a virtual cinema somewhere. But all of that sort of technology is on the forefront. And it's entertainment and it's interaction. It's not uh, gamer. I like that. I like that. Martin, how about you? I, I was, yeah, I just going to say the upfront barrier of entry of having to buy a console or having to, you know, buy something for hundreds of dollars. Um, will just disappear, and, and that will actually work for AR and VR as well. Suddenly, will be ubiquitous mm-hmm. how it will get because um, there just won't be this massive outlay of saying I need to buy a six hundred dollar council. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Brand, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, um, I, I think everybody's correct. I mean, the, the the lines will begin to blur even more as as this stuff evolved um right now i know that there's a lot of people who are playing games on their mobile phones that didn't exist in the mobile universe even a year ago um you know you have call of duty and things of that nature like that that's a big deal um and that's not even on a cloud platform that's still running through the hardware um soon you know as the cloud gaming stuff becomes more of a thing um, the games will just get better and you, you won't know if it's running locally or running in the cloud or what. I mean, you'll, you'll just be playing. <laughs> so yeah, I think the definition <laughs> will blur to a point where it maybe even loses the negative connotation that it has right now. I know a lot of people who um, talk about their kids being gamers, you know, some older people go, like, mm, that's not a good thing. And then you know, some of us younger people are like, well, I just saw kids making millions. <laughs> right. right, that's right. Like, Fortnite like, champion made more than the Masters, the winner of the Masters. I yeah. mean. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's becoming a positive thing, and it's becoming a, a thing that's universal, and that, that's very good. Um, that's what we want, you know, get closer to that world peace thing. <laughs> That's right. We'll be through gaming. Yep. This, is the, this, is it. this is the future. Future of cloud gaming is world peace. Um, final, final thought. Final thoughts as we we're, we're 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 pretty much right up uh, right up against our time. But big the biggest question is how how do any developers take advantage of this move? How do how do how do any developers take advantage of cloud gaming to the max? How do they Take advantage of the changing idea of, you know, of gamers. It's it being everybody. How do we do it? That's a really tough uh, question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something out there just to see uh, what other people's reactions are to it. So yeah. I think what the the key thing uh, that certainly we see a lot of is the need to have some kind of uh, Connect experience within the game uh, and have that ability to do uh, with their friends, with strangers, with somebody else uh, in game. Because, you know, building a trip to a title to Stadia or trying to get discovered in that sort of world is tough. But that social experience of, of games is incredibly important. And, you know, one person picks up a game, they connect, they, show, they challenge their friends to play on it. That's an incredibly part of game discovery right now. Uh, so certainly, you know, taking advantage of those sorts of technologies to connect players is crucial, I think, to consider that during the game discovery process. So, I like that. I like that. Martin, you unmuted yourself as well? Yeah, I was going to say that the nice thing that is available now is that hopefully they, you know, the tools are available to build 
any game. There's no like having to build the game engine. So things like Unity are great for that. And with um, so cloud compute, then it, it it comes more down to an indie being able to create something that is totally different, um, and then just go you know build something that hasn't been built before, um, and build something that is interesting for people to play. And I think that. The creative idea of all of that is now become the key thing rather than having to rebuild cloud infrastructures or game engines. And it's just focusing, basically trying to build something that EA is not going to build. You know, try not building another first person shooter. Mark, Bruce, Justin? Uh, I'm, I'm, I think as, a, uh, as an indie, you're going to have to watch this space for a little bit, right? This, it is still a nascent industry, despite the fact it's been around for a decade. I think when you look at things like um, Plague or Hatch or some of those others out there, what they're really doing is they're enabling content that's already sort of in market to come out. And so that's a great thing, right? I can now run my Steam library, I can run uh, other games. But I think when we start talking about new experiences, we've also got to understand what some of those platforms are bringing to, to bear there, which they haven't done yet, right? We, we haven't, we've only just uh, started to hear what Stadia is going to be. We're only just starting to think about it. Even Stadia is saying it's going to take three years before they develop a Stadia experience, and they've got a lot more budget than most people. So keep in mind that it is a new space, and you've got to look for your audience. You've really got to understand what is the audience you want to reach, and build that platform because that's ultimately, as Mark said earlier, and I've noted as well, is we've got to be looking at the economics of it as well, and that those economics have to make that return for you for the game you build. And so you've got to be sort of keeping in mind how do I monetize? How will I make the success of it? Is that audience there yet for me to avoid uh, to be able to sort of dive into this? Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I'm, you know, I don't have all, a whole lot to add. I do think that um, I came up with a saying a while ago when I was at Activision um, because of something Bobby Kotick told me. And as much as I disagreed with him most of the time, he was right on this. Um, not a whole lot of advantage of being a uh, bleeding edge in our industry when cutting edges will do. Bleeding edge is your bleed, cutting edge is the person following the person who's bleeding. So as an indie, taking a lot of risk is putting a lot of time and money on stuff that leading edge doesn't make a lot of sense. I think you just watch the space and become a fast follower. And the advantage you have, you don't have infrastructure and the costs. And, and it's not like trying to turn around an aircraft carrier. You can move a lot quicker. So I just think you got to pay really close attention to the space. And as soon as you see something you think it, you can take advantage of, then you jump on. I like that. That's good. Mark? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know that I have a lot to add, but I'll just amplify two points that have already been made. But, you know, I just amplify them because so I really think, you know, they're they're important. And, and it's the social component. Um, I, I think engineering your, your you know, your games um, and maybe even going to existing uh, catalog, but certainly anything new that, you know, somebody's developing moving forward. Um, even if you're not sure how you're going to uh, actually implement that today, um, but knowing, having a roadmap of where social is going to fit into it so that uh, either when the you know gaming platforms are developed to the point that you can actually implement the features or, or, or your budget allows or, or, you know, or whatever, but, but being intentional about that, that's the first point. I think social just, any new game that that isn't engineered with social as 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 potentially at some point down the road, maybe even a primary component, I think is going to be limited. That's that's the first point I want to amplify. And and the and the second is the the idea of of these of device ubiquity and and and, and this is also you know kind of similar. Um, yeah, you know, right now you might be developing for one or two, you might be on the PC platform, it might be for a console or a set of consoles, so it might be a constraint, but also designing into the roadmap, uh, you know, of, of, it could be features, it could be, you know, um, different play options, whatever, but knowing, hey, at some point, 
we can see a very, we have a very clear vision for what we could do on a mobile device. How are we going to do that? I have no idea. What platforms are going to run on? I have no clue. But I can, I can, but I can tell you how it would work. So that then as this develops and, you know, when we get three to five years down the road or whenever it is, and, and maybe a, 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 you know, maybe Unity has you know, has has commercialized a platform that exposes a lot of the hard stuff, you know, or, 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 you know, whoever, uh, you know, and, and makes it easy. Now my game already was architected with, with, with that in mind. And and so, you know, at least I don't have to go back and rethink. I'm not like, okay, now I've got to re-engineer all my gameplay. Um, so those are, I think, from an indie, uh, you know, producer perspective, um, uh, what I would just be really just thinking about. Uh, I think the message is very clear that it, it, it's almost, there's really not, it's almost not even possible to just run out today and go implement a cloud gaming solution because there's just so, um, there's so many pieces that aren't connected yet. Um, and so on one hand, it, it'd be easy to, it'd be tempting to just sort of say, hey, I don't have to worry about it. You know, I just kind of watch it, but I can keep developing. Um, and, and and you could do that, but it's probably smart to be thinking about social very, very heavily and be um, also, um, you know, really thinking about, you know, what sort of alternate device experiences or, you know, it may even be follow-on um, sale experiences, you know. So maybe there's capabilities that you can sell down the road you know, that when somebody wants to take their mobile phone with them, leave the house, they can continue the experience. But it's a different thing, you know, but you can charge for that, you know. So that might be a way to extend. I like that. That's very good. And we are we are pretty much out of time. So I, everyone. I'd like, to, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Bruce. I'd like to be a little bit cheeky. Uh, it's flush coming up for those that might be aware in Helsinki in a couple of weeks. And at the night, on the 19th, on the Friday afternoon, there's going to be an event called Fast Forward. There's going to be a whole pile of panels and sessions talking about the cloud and the future of the cloud and gaming and interactive entertainment. So if anybody's going out there, check out that event. There's going to be some great stuff happening out there as well. Okay, perfect. Bruce, what was that called one more time? It's called Fast Forward, and it's going to be at the Slush event in Helsinki. Fast forward. Perfect. That sounds excellent. Well, we're out of time. I really appreciate everyone for attending, for uh, Dirk, for putting this thing together and, and letting me uh, get up here and, and try to manage this thing. <laughs> um, Matthew, Bruce, Mark, Barn, Justin, Brandon, thank you so much for, for all of your contribution. This was Thanks for hosting and uh, hope it wasn't too bad from the road. <laughs> no, no, not, 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 not bad at all. But this was great. So, again, I really appreciate everybody. This was extremely valuable. The content of this roundtable was it exceeded what I was hoping. So I hope our audience feels the same way and uh, really appreciate all of you. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Jason, Thank for you very much. the moderation. And uh, of course, thanks to, so much to, to you all to make this roundtable possible for participants of the event is empowered. I personally believe that cloud gaming will become a much bigger uh, topic than it is actually, and, and we from this tech side, we decided already to, to um, create an own event series for this team to bring, bring together all interested companies. Thanks to you all.